Part 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Oh, hi, Maggie. It's Greg. Hi, Greg. I'm phoning to check some information about some of the staff. I'm putting all the staff data into new files, and I noticed that I don't have files for two people. I think you might have them. Oh, really? What are their names? Peter Austin and Jane Moore. Let me have a look. Yes, I've got them here. Shall I send them to you? No, you don't need to. Just give me the information now. I can write it on some new files. I don't really need the photos if you've got photos there. OK. Well, Peter Austin first. Now, is that Austin with an I or Austin with an E? It's A-U-S-T-I-N and his address is 110 Argyle Street, Tunbridge Wells, Kent, TN3 5RQ. 110? Uh -huh. And his phone number? It's 07984 645 792. OK. And how old is he? He's 47. 47. And what about his marital status? He's married. There's a note here that he has three children, two boys and a girl. OK. And finally, when did he join the company? He started with ESCO in August 2003. Thanks, Maggie. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, what about Jane? Her name's Jane Moore, that's M-O-O-R-E, and her address is 72 Cedar Road, Crowborough, Kent, CR3 5RQ. CR3 and what, sorry? CR3 5RQ. And how do you spell Cedar? C-E-D-A-R. Her phone number is 07984 650 396. 07984 650 396. Yes. Now, she's 22 and she's single. OK. And she started with ESCO in 2005, February 2005. Right. Thanks, Maggie. That's very helpful. <laughs> Goodbye now. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide speaking to a group of tourists who are visiting a part of New Zealand called Rotorua. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Hello everyone, and I'd like to welcome you all to Rotorua, one of the most famous destinations in New Zealand, where we have a long history of welcoming visitors. I'd like to explain a bit about the geography of this amazing region, famous for its geothermal activity, and tell you what we've planned for your stay. Well, if you'd like to have a look at the map of the region that's in your welcome pack, if you find Lake Rotorua on the top left, the big triangular lake, we've just driven down along State Highway 5, SH5, down the western side of the lake, and then we turned off through the town, and we're here at the Lakes Motel, just around the southern tip of the lake, OK? Now tomorrow, we'll be heading off along SH30 in the opposite direction from the town, towards Lake Rotoita, where we'll be visiting the Hell's Gate Thermal Reserve. This is the area between the SH30 road and the lake, and I'll be telling you more about this in a minute. We'll then be returning to the motel, and in the afternoon, we'll be visiting the town of Rotorua itself, and also the Arts and Crafts Institute, which is just along the SH30 from the motel, where it meets the SH5 outside the town. Now, if you look directly out of the motel towards the southeast, in the opposite direction to Lake Rotorua, you can just see the peak of Mount Tarawera, and the day after tomorrow, we'll be visiting the volcanic valley which was formed when this last erupted. We'll drive down the SH5 and then head off towards Lake Rotamahana. The valley's on the opposite side of the lake from the mountain, so you can see what a powerful effect the eruption had. There's also an interesting archaeological site, a village buried by the same eruption on the western shores of Lake Tarawera, just to the north. But I'm afraid we won't have time to visit that as a group, although you may wish to go there on your own. However, on the way back towards Rotorua along the SH5, we'll be stopping at Tamaki Village, which is on the main road about 12 kilometres outside town. Before you hear the rest of the program, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. So now let me tell you a bit more about these attractions. Just driving past the lake and through the town, I'm sure you've realised this is somewhere quite different from anywhere else in the world. So tomorrow, we'll start by visiting Hell's Gate Thermal Reserve. This is the most active area of the region volcanically and you'll see New Zealand's largest boiling whirlpool, where the water is actually 100 degrees centigrade, together with the largest hot waterfall in the Southern Hemisphere, where it's a more comfortable 40 degrees centigrade, just right for a hot shower. Entry is just $12 for adults and $6 for children. We'll come back to the motel for lunch, after which we'll visit the Arts and Crafts Institute, where you can learn about Maori people who lived here before the Europeans came. There's a display of Maori carving, showing this traditional skill at its most impressive, and exhibitions where you can learn about the use of geothermal waters for cooking food and for medicinal purposes. Entry is free and you'll find plenty to do there for the whole afternoon. The following day we'll be visiting another highlight of the region, the Volcanic Valley. This is a very new part of New Zealand. The valley was formed less than 150 years ago in 1886 when Mount Tarawera erupted violently, completely destroying the beautiful pink and white terraces that used to attract tourists to the region. After lunch, you can take a boat trip to see the volcanic activity at the edge of the lake. That's $25 for adults and $5 for children. We'll then be spending the afternoon learning more about traditional Maori life and pre-European New Zealand at Tamaki Village. As you walk around this recreated village, your Maori guide will tell you more about this traditional culture, and as the sun sets, you can enjoy a traditionally cooked feast known as the hangi, that's H-A-N-G-I, consisting of meat and vegetables cooked over hot stones, which are placed in a hole in the ground and covered with earth. And there's no extra charge for this, it's all included in the basic cost of your holiday. Now does anyone have any questions? 
That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear Elliot, an environmental science student, talking to his tutor about an essay he is writing on captive breeding programs. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Uh, Dr. Ran? Oh, come in, Elliot. Thanks for sending me the draft of your extended essay. Now, you're writing about captive breeding of endangered species, aren't you? Yes. OK. Well, this isn't a bad first draft. But there are some issues I think we need to discuss. Yes. I wasn't sure if I'd done enough research before I started writing. I'd say you've got plenty here. Too much in places. Mm. You've got this very long introduction on factors threatening the survival of species now and in the future, for instance. It's interesting, but it doesn't address the main issue of this essay. Oh, I, I thought I needed to give supporting evidence for my ideas. Yes, but only for key ideas. Mm. You can't cover everything. You've got to focus on the area you've chosen, which is the breeding of endangered species in captivity. Now, you have lots of relevant material about that, but I think you need to look at the planning of your central section again. At present, it's all rather a jumble. Oh, you mean I need to write it all out again? Well, it's just a matter of moving the things round a bit. Your introduction needs a rethink, as I said. Why don't you just begin by saying what captive breeding is? Give a definition. That's right. Mm. Then you should make it clear which are positive points and which are negative ones. For example... You start with the fact that breeding endangered species in captivity may be the only way we have of preserving some from extinction in the years to come, which is clearly an advantage. Now, what other advantages did you mention? Uh, well, the whole thing about zoos, that since they're the obvious places for captive breeding to take place, this could justify their role in the future. They're not just a place for people to go and stare at animals for fun. And then there's the point that captive breeding eventually allows the animals to be reintroduced to the wild again, in theory at least. Right. So put those points together. Then the disadvantages. Well, uh, the point that these programmes are very expensive, obviously, then thinking about the animals themselves, the psychological effects of captivity. Yes. And you also had a good section on the problem of disease for animals in captivity. But maybe you could have mentioned the poor success rate when they are eventually reintroduced into the wild. Right. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now your next sections on requirements for successful release of these animals into the wild. I think you need some evaluation here. Which of these requirements are more important and which are less important according to the available data? I had some information about that, but I wasn't sure if I needed to put it in. Yes, definitely. Um, my first point, for example, that's to do with the fact that animals bred in captivity have to be taught how to survive before they're released. All the data shows that's absolutely essential. Unfortunately, if they're just released without training, they won't know how to hunt and how to avoid predators and so on. Some articles suggest that it's necessary, actually, to provide food and shelter for the animals after they've been released, at least for the first few months. But the research suggests that this is less crucial to the successful reintegration of the animals. Right. You also mentioned the idea of providing employment for local people in the areas where the animals were being re-released and education, so that they'll see the return of the animals into their habitats as a positive thing. Yes, that sounds important to me, but I couldn't actually find any statistics or information about it. And I'd have thought it was really important to screen the animals to be sure they were healthy before they were returned to the wild, but the figures show that actually it doesn't make much difference. That's surprising, yes. Did you get any data on the effects of acclimatization? Yes. It showed that if animals are kept on the site where they were to be released for a time in order to acclimatize, they have a far better survival rate than those released directly into the wild. OK. Well, you've got some good information there. Have you thought at all about your final section? Well... I think I'll be looking at the whole question of habitat protection and whether in fact captive breeding is the answer or whether we can protect endangered species within their natural habitat. That sounds fine. So, I think if you go away and make those changes, that sounds quite promising. Thank you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an orientation lecture on sports therapy. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning and welcome to the University's Open Day and to our lecture on sports therapy. There are two good reasons to be here. Firstly, you will experience what a university lecture is like, so take out your notebook and pen. And secondly, you will find out about the sports therapy programme. OK. So what does a sports therapy programme involve? Everybody in today's society knows the impact sport, health and fitness makes on the population's physical and mental health. Studying at Kent will develop your understanding of the ideas and issues within the sports therapy, health and fitness industries. Sports therapy is one of the fastest growing careers within the sports sector. The programme teaches you all the specialist knowledge you need in order to work within these industries. 
This includes scientific aspects such as anatomy and physiology and sports psychology. You learn how to design training programs and lifestyle profiles for a range of clients and to understand the role of sports promotion and event management. The degree also covers the treatment and prevention of sporting injuries and the importance of referral programs. There will be a full description of these subjects for you available at the door when you leave this lecture. Now, just talk a little about teaching and assessment. The programme involves taking part in and designing practical sports sessions, lectures, small group seminars and private study. On average you have six lectures, three practical sessions and a one hour long seminar per week and you also spend additional time developing your coaching and theoretical knowledge in real-life situations. At Stage 1, the first half of the year is assessed by 100% coursework and observed assessments. A majority of the modules also have written exams within the final half of the year, with the rest practically assessed. Stage 2 and 3 assessment varies from 100% coursework to a combination of examination and coursework, usually in the ratio 50-50, 60-40 or 80-20. You're probably wondering what career paths you can take once you've completed this degree. Well, careers can vary from employment in health and fitness clubs, sports injury clinics, sports development within local authorities or with national governing bodies of sport working in community leisure or sports attractions, self-employed personal trainer or sports therapist. There are some requirements you need to fulfil to enter this course. International students can qualify with the following. School certificates and higher school certificates awarded by a body approved by the university, matriculation from an approved university with a pass in English language at GCSE O level or an equivalent level in an approved English language test, passing one of Kent's foundation programmes, provided that you meet the subject requirements for the degree course you intend to study, or an examination pass accepted as equivalent to any of the above. In order to enter directly onto a degree course, you also need to prove your proficiency in English, and we ask for one of the following. Average 6.5 in IELTS test, minimum 6.0 in reading and writing, grade B in Cambridge Certificate of Proficiency in English, grade A in Cambridge Advanced Certificate in English, a pass overall in the JMB slash NEAB test in English for overseas students, with at least B in writing, reading and speaking modules, a TOEFL score of at least 580 written test, or 237 computer test. If you haven't yet reached those standards, Kent runs a foundation course for international students, which gives you a year's academic and language training before you begin on your degree. Right, that's about it. Any questions? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.